Hi, I'm David Dollar, host of the Brooklyn's Trade Podcast, Dollar and Cents. Today, my guest is Celia Bailin, Interim Director of the Center on the U.S. and Europe at Brookings. We're going to talk about the French elections. Uh, not long ago, Emmanuel Macron was reelected as president. But more recently, we've had French parliamentary elections with surprising results. So welcome to the show, Celia. Thank you, David. Very happy to be here. Yeah, so let's start with your general reaction to the parliamentary results. Well, you know, it's a, it's an unprecedented situation. We are having a situation that um, was never expected. Uh, Emmanuel Macron was just re-elected president in April uh, after um, uh, competition, in particular against the far right, Marine Le Pen, which he won uh, by a large margin, even if this margin is smaller than five years ago. But just, uh, you know, a month and a half later, we have a parliamentary election that everybody was expected to go in Macron's way. And actually, um, the the results are are very uh, spectacular. Macron has lost its majority. So the majority would stand at uh, 289 a member of parliament and uh, Macron and his coalition called Ensemble together uh, just got 246 seats. What it means concretely is that uh, he will have to find a solution to uh, for his legislative agenda to be able to go through. In losing this majority, it's also major MPs from the Macron camp that have lost. For example, the president of the Assemblée Nationale so the, the main um, personality at the, at the head of uh, the National Assembly, uh, Richard Ferrand, a strong Macron ally, a political ally, just lost his seat, as well as the, the head of his political group, Christophe Castaner, former minister of the interior. So it's really a blow to Macron and Macron's camp um, in, a, in a very big way. The other two big elements that we need to, to realize after this election is that the first, the leftist alliance uh, made an, an unexpected show of force and really got a big chunk of the vote and ended up with 142 MPs. This is unexpected because only you know six months ago, the left was in total disarray, divided between the socialist, the Greens, and uh, the far left, France Insoumise. All of these parties were unable to reach the second round of the presidential election. None of them was expected to to do very well. But many, many voters rallied behind Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the the head of the France Insoumise, who was able then to translate this show of force at the presidential election into a coalition and made a very, very uh, strong case for uh, the uh, legislative uh, election. And the third element that is probably the most striking of the three is that the far right, Marine Le Pen's party, the national rally, is at the highest point it's ever been. It got 89 seats. It is 10 times more than in 2017. So only five years ago, um, the far right got eight seats. So 89 seats is really a record. It is also, you know, three times higher than it's uh, the the highest point it had ever been in the past, back in the 80s, when Jean-Marie Le Pen, then Marine's father, was the head of the the National Front. So really, this is a show of force for uh, the far right. And um, it doesn't bode very well for for Macron's capacity to, to govern for the next five years. Okay, so we'll come back to the far right in a couple of moments because those are the most shocking results. But first, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the left, since the left alliance is going to be the main opposition group in parliament now. And as you said, not long ago, they were in disarray. So is it really just better organization among this pretty large number of parties that that the left comprises or has there been a real shift in sentiment of French people, you know, towards the kind of issues, often bread and butter issues that the that the left candidates run on? I know that's a hard question to answer, but I wonder what your impression is. So uh, it's clearly a combination of politics and, and policy. P- 
politics wise, you know, in 2017, when Macron came in and running on a centrist platform, he was able to really split the left and get uh, the center left voters to vote for him. And uh, that was the, the strength of his coalition at the time. He was himself an advisor, a top, uh, you know, second person in the Elysee Palace to François Hollande. So he was coming from that camp anyway and had brought with him many other leftist politicians, socialists in particular. Five years down the road, uh, Macron has uh, ruled and governed uh, with an, a center-right orientation, or at least he has given very little thought to sort of trying to, to attract and, and retain the center-left voters. He has been disappointing for many people on the environmental side, uh, has not defended many uh, ecological priorities. On the social side, it's really the increase of inequalities. To be fair, obviously, we've had, you know, the challenge of COVID, the challenge of the war in Ukraine now, uh, many different reasons for which, you know, the, the social situation in France might be uh, difficult. But in any case, Macron has not given that many, much thought in cultivating the left. And the left has rebelled. But only, you know, a year to six months ago, all these um, sort of anti-Macron sentiment, or at least a longing for something else, were not translating into any group in particular, because everybody was looking for a unity candidate. But the divisions between the socialists, the Greens, France Insoumise, all seemed so strong that they were impossible to overcome. What's happened is that in the first round of the presidential election, the third men of the election, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, came one point, one percentage point away from Marine Le Pen. So he, he almost made it to the second round, and he didn't. The reason he almost made it is that there was little by little the, the feeling that unity for the left was the way to go. And so out of this frustration of not pushing Jean-Luc Mélenchon to the second round, he was able to uh, call for a larger coalition create that coalition with the socialists and the Greens and the communists and present candidates all over France in unity candidates, meaning that uh, very often voters would go to the poll and have the choice between one or two far-right candidates, two uh, maybe right-wing candidates plus the Macron candidate, but just one unity leftist candidate. And so that reinforced very, very much their capacity to attract votes. And so apart from a few dissidents here and there, you have seen political unity, which does not necessarily mean alignment in policies, and we'll, we shall see that down the road, but this political unity has really paid off. And so what about the far right now? Uh, as you mentioned, Marine Le Pen, you know, she did quite a bit better in the presidential election than she had done five years before. And then there was this explosive growth in parliamentary seats. You know, what is the attraction there? What, why is the right getting this support? That's the really striking element. For the longest time, we've been used to having Marine Le Pen creeping up during presidential election, uh, sometimes getting high percentage of uh, the polls or, or vote intentions either on her name for presidential election or, you know, in a regional, local elections, sometimes European elections as well. But as far as the uh, parliamentary elections were concerned, because this is a, um, a, a system of two rounds, and because in the second round, even if the far right makes it to the second round, you've seen a unity of all other parties against the far right, the far right was always unable to translate the appetite of maybe 30% of the population into actual seats. This has profoundly changed. Under the leadership of Marine Le Pen, you've had several um, transformations. One of them is the normalization of the national rally. Marine Le Pen and her camp now refuse to be called far right or extreme right. They want to say that they are uh, just a hard right and that they are 
a nationalist party, a, a patriotic party, I, I should I should say, and that is pushing for a you know general idea on how to defend the French. And doing so, she has watered down some parts of her program, mostly on the surface, mostly on, on providing an image that would be an image of responsibility, claiming she's ready to be in power, claiming that she wouldn't, you know, shake the system too much. She has watered down her anti-European uh, positions and 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 other uh, positions that were uh, the most striking. Even though I must say the program remains really radical, but this normalization process has allowed her to really expand her base. Secondly, in the meantime, you've had an even more radical far right uh, led by. Uh, Eric Zemmour, who is this TV pundit, uh, very, very extreme, who has launched a new party called Reconquête, Reconquest, which is really immigration obsessed and fully, you know, racist and xenophobic. So his party has also allowed the national rally to pretend that they are less radical. And so it has allowed them also to be to be normalized even more. And so all this process of normalization for, um, for, for the national rally has translated very nicely for them uh, in the second round of these parliamentary election, where uh, there was little to, to no Republican front, meaning very little uh, national rally coalition against them in the second round. And in particular, one of the most striking decisions has been the decision of the Macron camp to equate uh, the leftist alliance because it was conducted and led by Jean-Luc Mélenchon and his hard left coalition. He has equated this hard left coalition with national rally saying they're both terrible and we're not going to choose between them. And there was more than 60 occasions where The second round saw a national rally far-right candidate opposed to a new PES candidate, a leftist alliance candidate. When this happened, in the vast majority of the case, the the Macron camp decided not to support the leftist alliance against the far-right. They just said, well, we should never vote for far-right, but they did not fully endorse the leftist alliance. And so half of these duels ended up uh, in the in the camp of the far right. And this this is how the far right made enormous gains as well in the fact that there is no more coalition to really push back on them. So these broad groupings we're talking about, the far right, the center, the Macron group in the center, the left, they have very different views on a range of domestic political issues, policy issues like retirement age, minimum wage, climate policy. And and then, as you say, Celia, within the left, there are quite a few different parties. They have different views. So my, my next question is, is this a recipe for paralysis or, you know, to make an analogy to the United States where the system is quite different, but still we've had cases where a sitting president has had to face a pretty hostile Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, And often the result of that has been practical compromises that are hard to get through when one party is in control. So uh, any chance this will, there'll be kind of a silver lining and we'll get some things done? Or are we really looking at paralysis on the domestic agenda? So the the most obvious answer to to your question is that paralysis and, and is around the corner. It's the, the most obvious output because there's very very little that these parties can agree on and in particular as far as the far left far right and even the leftist alliance are concerned they have very little appetite for working with Emmanuel Macron which they have tended to also demonize and, and reject during their own campaign but I must say we are in a very different situation than the United States because this is not a polarized game. This is a very 
extended array of choices uh, going from uh, all the way to uh, the most uh, you know populist left uh, going through a center left a center center right a, a hard right wing traditional right conservative to a, a hard populist nationalist right down to the potentially the xenophobic far right, even though they did not make it into the, the parliament. So this large array of voices means also that uh, it's less of a zero sum game and Macron should be smart in not trying to, to put himself in this situation uh, because that has led to his defeat in, in these elections where it's him against everybody else. He should instead, and, and it's probably an, a real opportunity for Macron, he should embrace what he's been preaching for the past five years, which is to overcome the left-right divide, to overcome sort of the paralysis of partisanship and try and offer um, ad hoc coalitions on the type of legislation he wants to see through. One of the difficulties of that is that it requires a lot of politicking, a lot of, of working with the, the, the National Assembly, a lot of understanding every locally elected MP's priorities or the general priority of their political group, et cetera. Some really working the legislative process. But if they were able to do that, it's not actually impossible for Macron to govern. He will just have to, to focus on the uh, National Assembly in a way he's never done before. And so one of the big questions is that who is going to be able to do that for him and with him? Uh, there is a question on the capacity of the prime minister, Elisabeth Borne, who is more of a technician, who is very much in tune with Emmanuel Macron, but he's just freshly elected to the National Assembly. Is she in a capacity to do that? That's that's a big question. And um, if he is unable to do that, to find ad hoc coalition for every one of his uh, priorities, obviously including some of the priorities of the opposing party, we might then face a total blockade and paralysis in which case one of the options maybe within a year, and uh, it has been rumored already, is that the president can decide on the dissolution of parliament, which will launch the parliament into new election within a month. In that case, Macron can make the case that, you know, whatever voters have voted a year prior is not working. He needs a majority. But this is also unlikely to be successful. So there's a real opportunity and, and probably interest in Macron in trying to make this work partly. It would reduce political tension. It would allow for some form of national unity. But, you know, it's, it's still a far reach at this point. So let's shift gears, Celia, and talk a little bit about foreign policy. As I see it, France and President Macron have been pretty strong supporters of the Ukraine, of sanctions against Russia, of the Western coalition essentially uh, trying to, in a sense, overturn this Russian invasion of Ukraine. Do, do these parliamentary results affect his ability to operate in the foreign policy realm? How, how do these different groups, the far right versus this coalition on the left, you know, how, how do they see the whole struggle around the uh, Ukraine war? That's a very good question. I think you have sort of two answers to that. One will be Macron's attitude. As I said, you know, if he wants to have a legislative agenda, it's going to require a lot of domestic political game that he needs to focus on that would probably take his priority. Uh, he, he, will, he will have to, to focus on this very strongly if he wants this to happen. But the president also has the option to take care uh, mostly of foreign policy, and that's very much into Macron's DNA. You know, he wants to reshape Europe. He wants to take care of foreign policy. He's interested in multilateralism, in, in strategy, not as much into, uh, you know, what happens locally, what happens at the National Assembly. So if he's able to get a prime minister to do that job or, you know, a few strong political leaders that can focus on this, maybe he'll be able to continue 
what he was hoping to be his legacy, which is transforming Europe, pushing for European sovereignty. And there, he has more leeway probably than in other Western democracies that uh, if he doesn't need the legislation, he can make the speeches, make a series of recommendations, uh, take decisions at uh, his level that don't necessarily need uh, the approval of, of parliament. One of the sticky points, of course, will be continuing French support for sanctions. At this point, the vast majority of the French political class agrees on sanctions and is actually very supportive of Ukraine, agrees that uh, not only are they uh, necessary to punish Russia Mm -hmm. after what's happened, but they should proceed with it, that it's a matter of investing in the the freedom of Europe by, uh, you know, drawing a line in the sand on this uh, conflict. But it all depends on how much impact should it have on household? And in particular, who should pay for the impact? The leftist coalition is pushing for some form of bump up in minimum wage for blocking the prices of produce of necessity. There's a series of very leftist ideas that are trying to protect the working class and the middle class from the effect of these sanctions. The far right is uh, really focused on, uh, and Marine Le Pen in particular, on the energy crisis and on trying to reduce the price of gas at the pump and and other uh, sort of consideration on that front. But basically, all of them are worried on the impact of sanctions on households, the impact of inflation, which is one of the opportunity, but it's going to be it's going to be a difficult conversation an early opportunity for this government to discuss with the new uh, parliament on the opportunity of a law on purchasing power, on cost of living, which was a bill that had been in preparation prior to the election that the Macron government or the Elizabeth Bourne government was hoping to pass in the summer. He will need they will need to get some support from the left and for the right to pass this legislation. Uh, Celia, the last question I want to ask you concerns France's relations with the U.S., but also uh, global issues like China. Uh, The United States is essentially viewing the world as a contest between democracies and authoritarians. And I'm just wondering how that's playing out in France in general and whether there are clear differences among these political blocks we've been discussing in terms of receptivity to this idea. Well, thank you, David. That's a very uh, fascinating question because uh, partly this idea on the relationship of all of these parties to democracy has been an ongoing theme of these elections, in particular because within the the leftist alliance, the leftist alliance has been coalescing around the party of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, France Insoumise, coalescing with socialists and Greens, etc., that have deep contradictions within the movement on the relationship to, you know, Western democracies, basically, versus the rest of the world. And Jean-Luc Mélenchon himself and some of the France Insoumise supporters have had ambiguities, to say the least, in their relationships with Russia, with some of the socialist authoritarians around the world, Cuba, Venezuela, and other types of countries for which they have some sort of romantic attachment, including even sometimes all the way to, uh, you know, ambiguities on on Syria and Assad and other types of regime. Ambiguities for which, you know, some on the center left have been really turned off and really in disagreement. So now that there's a show of force of this leftist alliance, these deep contradictions will come to the fore again. And there's a need for the leftist alliance to really clarify its position on authoritarians, in particular, former communist blocs authoritarians, for which they have these ambiguities. But more generally, France is spontaneously and systematically in the camp of democracies against authoritarian uh, countries. But it doesn't like to say so. This is not official French foreign policy because fundamentally, 
French foreign policy and France believe in multilateralism, in the creation of a rule-based order, not a value-based order. And that's a big difference with uh, the United States. What Macron has tried to push, and it, his predecessors before that, is a result-oriented multilateralism, a multilateral system that could work for anybody, regardless of the nature of the regime of, of the country in question, as long as you respect the rules, as long as you contribute to international law, as long as you respect, you know, all sorts of rules set together by international organizations. This is France's priority. It's also a way for France to relate to other countries that are not either the big Western democracies or the big authoritarian competitors. But it's a way for France to relate to African partners, to Asian partners, to many other countries around the world. And so this is widely shared in a French context. And these elections will not change that. It will continue to be the, the priority. However, in the face of the Russian aggression of Ukraine, in the face of Ukraine who wants to join the EU and a sort of uh, a feeling of aggression against European democracies, recently France has been very, very strongly on the side of democracies. And even if it's not trumpeting it in, in a democracy versus authoritarian type of frame, it is very much present in everybody's mind and, and the solidarity on that front will continue. That's really fascinating. Thank you, Celia. I'm David Dollar, and I've been talking to my colleague Celia Bailin about the French elections and the complicated politics in this important country, how it affects France's domestic policies, but also foreign policy issues, relations with the United States, et cetera. So thank you very much, for Celia, for walking us through the import of these elections. Thank you, David. It was a pleasure. Thank you all for listening. We release new episodes in Dollar and Cents every other week. So if you haven't already, follow us wherever you get your podcasts and stay tuned. It's made possible by support from producer Fred Dews, audio engineer Colin Crookshank, and other Brookings colleagues. If you have questions about the show or episode suggestions, you can email us at podcasts at brookings.edu. Dollar and Cents is part of the Brookings Podcast Network. Find more Brookings podcasts on our website, brookings.edu slash podcasts, and follow us on Twitter at Policy Podcasts. Until next time, I'm David Dollar, and this has been Dollar and Cents.